We're going to be in Luke chapter 23 today. I'll actually begin in reading in just a few verses from John, but uh, I will get to Luke 23 in one moment. Well, Father, we ask you bless your word. Lord, we're so thankful for the mothers that you have given us, Lord. The wisdom and the life that they have, that they have poured out. God, may you really just uh, be pleased with how we honor our mothers today. In Jesus' name. <clears throat> Luke 23. It's interesting to me that the trial and execution of Jesus goes the way that it does. You so see the grace and the sovereignty of God contrasted with the the evil hearts of men. But where sin abounds, grace does even more abound. And it's interesting to me that we see in the book of Hebrews that Jesus Christ upholds everything. All creation is held together by Him. When I was going through school, I had a fancy name, which is probably outdated now, but it was atomic glue. Didn't know why things hold together. We know because it's the will of our Lord that they do. And that He created all things, as Colossians 1 points out to us. And yet in this demonstration of love, and when rejected by His own, in a death and trial that were just atrocious, <clears throat> being his hands and the, the major nerves in it being pierced by the metal that he had formed, being beaten by knuckles that he had created in their mother's wombs, their voice crying out against him with the very breath that he gave them, as God holds even our next breath. The demonstration of love and fortitude by the Lord Jesus Christ through this time shows us that we don't look at a man who is a victim, but we look at a, a victor, the glory, the demonstration of the love and of great, the great God and Savior. So as we look at this a little bit more today as we continue on, we're going to see a lot of contrasts and exchanges that happen. First one I'm going to I want to read before we get into Luke 23 is in John chapter 8. Excuse me, John chapter 3 verse 15 through 19. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. So we're going to see that unfold a little bit today in Luke chapter 23. We're going to see a guy come on the scene named Pontius Pilate, and he served for about 10 years in the region of Judea from A.D. 26 to A.D. 36. When he first came in, because he was kind of a rough and tough guy, he threw up the, the banners, the images of Rome in the temple and caused a lot of problems, which didn't go well for him. Then later he would take money from the temple to build an aqueduct under political pressure. And when the Jews rioted and came against him, he, he put secretly his soldiers out in the crowd and, and they had their swords and they silenced the voices of those who opposed him. This was the Pontius Pilate that the Jews are hoping to deliver Jesus to. One who is not afraid to execute. But we see him vacillate a little bit in this story. We don't see the normal pilot. And some say perhaps it's because of his previous mistakes that now he's got a lot of political pressure. Don't mess up again or you're in trouble because it keeps costing us a lot of problems whenever you 
do something foolish. That could be. Perhaps it's because of a dream of his wife or maybe he saw something in Jesus that he'd never seen in another man that caused him to, to wobble a little bit more than that was outside of his character. Because Josephus clearly portrays him as a cruel and decisive man. But we don't see someone quite so decisive here as we'll get into Luke 23. Because Pilate makes seven attempts to to free or give them an excuse to not prosecute Jesus. Seven attempts. And he boldly declares him innocent three times before Pilate goes down as the man who condemned to death Jesus of Nazareth as innocent. So I have some contrast today. Luke 23, verse 1. Then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate, And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. So after their (laughs) illegal sessions with the high priests, both the former and the current, and then bring him before the Sanhedrin, knowing that the, the blasphemy charge... Pilate wasn't going to care about. He wasn't going to care about any of the religious issues. So they bring up these new sets of charges before Pilate. This guy is creating insurrection, telling people not to pay their taxes, and he's exalting himself as a king. What are you going to do about it, Pilate? And it would have been quite interesting for Pilate, who, who woke up that morning planning on releasing someone, on taking someone who was going to be killed and giving them life. That was his plan, as he did on Passover. But now he's got this beaten and bloodied man before him with the accusations and an angry mob outside demanding he, that he do something. Verse 3, Then Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, It is as you say. So Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no fault in this man. But they were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. So the crowd not having anything of it. I find no fault in him. He's innocent. But they wouldn't hear it. There'd be four people this day that declare his innocence. Pilate, Herod, a centurion, and a robber. But no one listened. No one cared. But Pilate knew that insurrection was something, the rioting was something that he would have to keep a close eye on as governor of a very volatile place. You couldn't just let this get around or go unchecked, so he'd have to do something. But then he hears, ah, Galilee, let's send him off to Herod. I don't want to deal with this. Get these guys, get these religious nuts out of my hair. Verse 6, when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. Now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired for a long time to see him, because he had heard many things about him and hoped to see some miracle done by him. Then he questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing. So Herod and Antipas, part of a twisted and cruel family. Uh, We've talked about him quite a bit, and we'll go in-depth on him today. But kind of comes from a twisted and and crazy, crazy family. But uh, he he was the gentleman, as you remember, who after John the Baptist came and confronted him in his sin, wound up being responsible for killing him. So here he was, about to see Jesus, really excited, wanted to see some miracles, wanted a good show. But you know, it takes a lot more than miracles to believe. A miracle without the Word of God will just generally create more confusion, but never really generates true faith. And Herod had already silenced the word of God in his life. 
He'd taken the message of God, the, the forerunner for this man right here, and he, and he executed him. Ended the voice of God in his life. So Herod shows his true colors here in a moment. As he desires for miracles and a good time and the fulfilling of his flesh so often. But Jesus would answer him nothing. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29 through 11, 29 verse 31, says this, how much, more, how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God, trampled the Son of God underfoot and counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. As Herod counts the Son of God a, a common thing, not much better than a court jester, who could perform some miracles and entertain him. How much more will the judgment be upon him who counted the Son of God in his blood, a common thing. And one day, it has been for him a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Verse 10, And the chief priests and the scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Then Herod, with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and, and set him, sent him back to Pilate. That very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other. For previously, they had been at enmity with each other. Well, what a scene. He wants to get entertained, been excited to meet him. And as he questioned him, and Jesus gave him no response, as a, as a lamb silent, as a sheep before the slaughter, he didn't answer him, didn't, didn't speak. He had rejected what he already knew. He wasn't going to receive any more. And during the process, the religious leaders continued to vehemently accuse him. See, they were they would always been so concerned with exchanging their position and their status for faith in Christ. Everybody's going to follow this guy. Everything's going to change. I won't have the important seat. I won't have my religious position. I won't be somebody anymore. I've invested my whole life in doing this. They would not have it. And so they fought and sought to get rid of him. Pilate, he knew something about what was going on. He could see through this. But he was, will was not willing to take an unpopular stand. because It was going to upset the mob. Things weren't going to be peaceful. Perhaps even his job was on the line. It was going to be an unpopular stance. He wasn't willing to side with Jesus. And now we find Herod as well. Doesn't take Jesus seriously. Only wanted entertainment or self-satisfaction. You know, we find a lot of this in ourselves also before we have faith in Christ. That we're only interested in being entertained. What I can get out of this life. Not willing to take an unpopular stand. Just kind of go with the flow keep everything all right, make sure my job's okay, make sure life's all right. Or like the religious leaders, I don't want it to affect my position, who I am, my money, my, my coolness. These guys all had this. We had a little bit of it too. And if you're not in Christ, you may find a little bit of yourself surfacing. They chose darkness rather than light. But only if they had knew, known what was before them, they might not have exchanged their own soul for it. They thought the political status of what was going on, their religious status, their income, their satisfaction, their entertainment was worth. If they had only known they would exchange something so small for their very own life their soul. Jesus asked that question. What would a man exchange? Give an exchange for his soul. 
What's it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? And here it was, life before them, and they exchanged it for the lie. What will we exchange? We're going to see that a few more times. Verse 13, Then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to them, You have brought this man to me, one who misleads the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him. And indeed, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him, for it was necessary for him to release one of them at the feast. So Pilate here again tells them, innocent. Herod finds him innocent. I find him innocent. And even just maybe to make you happy, I'll, I'll scourge him, which, which was a, a brutal, a brutal thing. I'm not going to get too much into the cruelty of the cross and the scourging and everything that happened, because um, Luke really doesn't in this gospel. Um, so I'm not going to, not too much today. But it was a cruel punishment where you were typically strapped to a pole and a whip on the end of the leather lashes were glass or bone or pieces of metal or what have you, so that when they would whip you, it would stick into you, and, and as they pulled it off, it would rip ribbons of flesh. Um, many people would die from it. Probably also shortened their life on the cross and it made it a little bit easier, because sometimes people would live three to five days if they just went to the cross. There was one even recorded up to 13 days. But oftentimes, except for women and Roman officials and Roman soldiers, this was the case. They would be scourged. But here, this was just to appease, appease the crowd. A man with, who was beaten to a point where he was no longer recognizable, his beard pulled out, no sleep, whipped here to please the crowd. But as a crowd, as a mob mentality often is, when they have already made up their mind, nothing's really going to change that. And so many of the, the leaders and religious leaders fueled the crowd even, even much more. Love, men love darkness rather than light. And we'll all, ex apart from Christ, we'll always exchange truth for a lie. One of my favorites that I've been on recently, I shared a little bit on Wednesday night, was uh, Spontaneous Generation. Um, was widely held for, for a couple thousand years as, as valid, as real. You could take some, some cheese and a rag and throw it in a corner and it would spontaneously generate rats or mice. Or you could take, you know, um, what was the other one? You could take meat and throw it out and it would spontaneously generate maggots or flies. It would just happen. You could do your own experiment. Spontaneous generation was real. Well, along came the 1800s. And about halfway through there, Louis Pasteur and one other scientist who I forget off the top of my head um, did some experiments, and, and spontaneous generation became something that was a laughing stock because they had proved that life doesn't spontaneously generate. And so everybody laughed, and oh, of course, that's not real. But what are your options there at that point? Life either came into existence on its own, or God is real. So um, almost the exact same time, a uh, young scientist cruising around some islands and looking at some birds came up with a new theory. <laughs> the theory of evolution. Which states that if it rains on rocks for a really long time and some chemicals pool up, maybe something electrical hits it, life will spontaneously generate. They laughed to score on the old one, and they replaced it with one that just sounded a little bit better. But it's the same thing. Because men love darkness rather than light. <laughs> it's the same with as a scramble for a new, new thought process. As, as Albert Einstein proved or displayed that there was a beginning to space and time, 
how they have scrambled for why this doesn't mean that the only book that proclaimed a beginning of space and time, it's not true. Any port in a storm, men love darkness rather than light. Verse 18, And they all cried out at once, saying, Away with this man, and release to us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city, and for murder. Pilate, therefore, washing, <clears throat> wishing to release Jesus again, called out to them, but they shouted, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Then he said to them the third time, Why? What evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and of the chief priests prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that he should be as they requested, and he released to them the one they requested, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison, but, they deliver, but he delivered Jesus to their will. They loved darkness rather than light. A strange scene indeed when a ruthless leader of the Gentile world is defending the life of a Jewish king, prophet, and priest. Barabbas, the son of the father is what his name means. <laughs> so we have two sons of the father here. Jesus and Barabbas. John chapter 8, beginning in verse 44 and verse 45. Here Jesus says to these, probably many of the same gentlemen who are now accusing him, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. A murderer, a rebel, and a thief of his father, the devil, who is, what is his great passion for you to steal to kill and destroy the very representation of Barabbas's life to rebel to steal and to kill and we'll take him rather than Jesus exchanged the son of the father for Or the son of the father of lies and destruction. So that's what they were willing to exchange. Darkness for light. One who would take the kingdom physically by force. Would steal, kill and destroy to do anything to get his will done. Self-confidence. Would take that over their Messiah who was willing to lay down their life for him. For them. That's what they were willing to exchange. Verse 26. Now as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming from, a, from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. So here we enter another, another scene with Jesus, who's been in emotional distress so much that he would sweat blood, physically beaten, the crown of thorns, he's been scourged, walked many miles, no sleep, physically done. Now I'm of the, the opinion that, that historically the, the upright beam was usually in a, a consistent and permanent place and that you would have to carry the cross beam there. And they put that on Jesus' back and shoulders, usually weighed about 75 to 125 pounds. You were stripped naked, that put on your back, 
and forced to walk out through the crowd, oftentimes a soldier holding, holding what your crime was, so that everybody would know what happens when you cross Rome. Here's what happens. And so Jesus was taken as the common criminal was, and it usually wasn't the shortest way to the cross. But here he happens, just happens, we're going to also see the amazing sovereignty of God in the crucifixion of Jesus as well. And so this, it kind of begins here with it just so happens that Jesus fell down in front of this Simon of Cyrene. So this was North Africa, modern day Libya. So this man had probably traveled a little over 800 miles. Probably the trip of his lifetime. A, an African man who wanted to come and worship at the temple to bring an offering to sacrifice a lamb. Probably cruising down to 9 o'clock prayer at the temple and runs into this. And suddenly before him, this unrecognizably beaten and brutalized man falls at his feet, wondering what's going on, and then he gets a little tap on the shoulder by a Roman sword or a spear, which was Roman law that if they chose to, could choose you and you had to bear their burden for a mile or whatever it was that they were going to impose on you. And he had a choice at this point. Probably going to be now defiled, not going to be able to celebrate Passover. What would I tell my family? This, is, this has been a chance and an investment of a lifetime to worship and to honor God at this moment. And now this. What in the world? All the things that must have gone on in his heart at that moment. But he had an opportunity also to exchange something. <laughs> and it seems that this so impacted him. Maybe not in this moment. Maybe he saw him at the resurrection. But Simon, it seems, would become a believer in Jesus Christ. And taking up the cross of Christ would so impact him in his life that both Mark 15, verse 21, and Romans 16 speaks of his children as they are well known in the church. This moment that he could have said, no, this is, this is not what I bargained for, this isn't what I planned for, took up the cross of Jesus Christ and so impacted his life that it changed not only his life, but the life of his family forever. And they would go on to serve the Lord. Are we willing to do the same when we have such a goal such a time in life that we would exchange taking up our cross and following Jesus that it might so impact our life that our, that our children would be impacted, our community, our church. People would know who we are and that we follow the Lord, that only the mention of our name in those epistles or in the Gospels would be, oh yeah, these guys love Jesus. These guys follow Jesus. He exchanged the opportunity for living out this dream. Maybe not willingly, but he took the moment and it changed his life. Verse 27. And a great multitude of people followed him and the women who also mourned and lamented. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed, the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that never bore, and the breasts which never nursed. Then they began to say to the mountain, Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and the hills cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will they do? What will be done in the dry? So as they would take him to the cross, oftentimes crowds would form around a condemned man and, and here a group of women were, were mourning. Jesus here referring to what was going to come upon them in the judgment in 70 AD for rejecting their Messiah. When, when again they would resort within the, the walls of, of Jerusalem to cannibalism, plagues would break out as they would try to hold out against Rome coming against them. The horrors, we've talked about that a number of times, so I won't go too far back into it. But this was a reality. He said, don't weep for me, weep for yourselves. 
if they'd done this when the, green, when the wood was green, when Jesus was among them, when, when it was time to bear fruit, when they would judge an innocent man, what will they do when you're guilty? What will they do? Verse 32. There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. So here we see Isaiah's prophecy fulfilled that he was numbered among the criminals. And I believe this great prayer in verse 34 is one reason why they had a 40-year gap between judgment and the gospel exploded in their country and many people got saved because of the grace of God. That's not provable. That's just my opinion. Let's take it for what it's worth. But, but the Lord practiced what he preached. Father, forgive them. Forgive your enemies. Love them. And here they were, the enemies of our Lord, and yet he would die for them yet. Pray this prayer for them yet. Verse 35, And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with, with them sneered, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ, the chosen of God, the soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, Save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. And so God communicates through them to them through the three major languages really kind of in the in this in the world or at their time. There were other major languages as well, but here the the language of the learned or the scholars. Knowledge, Latin, the, the language of law and government, and Hebrew, the language of religion. Psalm 22 is always worth reading as you go through the passage on the cross and you see the sovereignty of God in the dividing of his clothes, in the, the mocking, and so many things going on that God way beforehand said, this is what it's going to look like. And Luke brings that out to us. The Lord brings that out to us. That this was, even though he had delivered them to their will, it was, it was still all within his will and what he knew would have come to pass. Verse 39. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, saying, Rebuke, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation. And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Both had equal access to Jesus. One looks for Jesus to Jesus for his greatest need. And he went against the influence of his friends, the religious leaders, the crowd, to trust in a dying king for a hope and a future. But he received so much more than that. He also received forgiveness as well as eternal life here. What a, what a statement of faith. What a, what a glorious picture God has given to us. What a story the theology of the thief. First, he feared, respected God. He understood and knew his sin. He knew Jesus and called out to Jesus and even called him Lord. And he believed that Jesus was who he said he was and believed in the promise of eternal life. Both had equal access to him. One rejected and one accepted. And one might ask, what side of the cross are you on? The one crying out to Jesus or the one rejecting him? Here, this guy had 
exchanged everything in his life, the train wreck of his life for eternal life. There was no Jesus and in this moment. There was no good works. There was no baptism. There was no communion. No daily Bible reading. Didn't have time to get a haircut and get a real job. Only the mercy and the grace of God that he confessed with his mouth and he believed in his heart that God could raise him from the dead. He called upon the name of the Lord and he was saved. There was no Jesus and. And he gives us this glorious story, though only one deathbed conversion. One, so that we might know that it's possible. That we might be comforted. But I think also he only gives us one deathbed conversion so that uh, we won't presume either. Don't wait till the end. The thief on the cross. Jesus said, Surely you will be with me today in paradise. What a glorious promise. Verse 44, Now it was about the sixth hour that there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. The sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last breath. The darkness that fell. So Jesus was on the cross for about six hours and here are three hours of, of darkness. Well, what a time that would have been. We talked a little bit about the judgment of sin, the judgment that Jesus was taking for us, and the difficulty in that last week. There were three days of darkness in Exodus before leading up to, to Passover, when the blood of the Lamb would spare them from the, the angel of death. And here we have three hours of darkness that leads up to it. I want to read to you quickly the seven statements that Jesus gave from the cross. Luke records a few of them. This before the darkness. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Today you will be with me in paradise. Woman, behold thy son. Son, thy mother. And then darkness. The next statements we find are, Why have you forsaken me? And I thirst. The darkness and the sin that would have been upon him, the, the Lord doesn't give us much description. We only know that it was the weight of the sin of the world. But in triumph, he finishes with, it is finished and into Father, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus was willing to trust the Father all the way to the end, willing to forgive his enemies all the way to the end. And in the midst of this, the veil was torn which Galatians says is his flesh, and we now have access to the Father. We can boldly come to the throne of grace. All of this is cleared. We now have a new and a living way. Jesus trading himself for this. Verse 47. So when the centurion saw that this had happened, he glorified God, saying, certainly this was a righteous man. And the whole crowd who came together to that site, seeing that he had what had been done, beat their breast and returned. But all, but all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. So a few different reactions as Jesus dies. So I want to close with a few points, and then we'll end in Hebrews chapter 10. The exchange. The first group we came across exchanged truth for a lie. Position, status, calming the mob, entertainment, selfishness. They exchanged that for Jesus. Next we saw the Son of God exchanged for the Son of the Father, Barabbas. The evil, rebellious murderer. Self-accomplishment. Third, we see Simon, his hopes, his plans, exchanged for the cross of Christ. The thief, the path in life, he exchanges ashes for beauty. A broken road for one, as Isaiah puts it, 
a highway of holiness that not even a fool will fall off of. That's what the thief exchanged, a brokenness for wholeness. Then lastly, we see the exchange of the just for the unjust, that he might bring us for, to God. Jesus exchanged heaven for earth. Equality with God for becoming the least of all. That he might make a wretched treasure. And if you don't know him today, he still offers that. Exchange for your sin, for your ashes, for your broken road, for your temporary life. He can give you eternal life wholeness, eternity, riches that yet that cannot be described. He holds out, but you've got to give that exchange. You've got to be willing to give it up. John the Baptist says, as I, I must decrease, the Lord must increase. We sang several songs of emptying me, take what I am, fill me, make me holy, to let go of the things that we have clung so tightly to that are not of Him, that we might know more of Him. Today, we've been encouraged to exchange maybe something that we plan to do or maybe some bitterness that we might honor our mother, that we don't hold on to these things, that we would give that same honor that maybe we've got in our heart. Make sure that you show that ex on the exterior today as you're commanded by the Lord. So I want to close with Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20 through 25. Hebrews 10, verse 20 through 25. Yeah, we'll read 19 too. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holy list by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which He consecrated for us through the veil, that is His flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love, and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. The veil is torn, the flesh is broken, and the blood of Christ is out there for you to be cleansed today, that you might enter boldly before our great God, His throne of grace, so let's exhort one another, love one another. Let's pray. Father, help us to do this as we see your day approaching. That we would not grab a hold of our selfishness, of our position or status or anything else that would hold us back from being complete followers of you, Lord, as we see your coming so near that you are coming. God, let us not count your son as something that is common but holy and worth exchanging anything that you ask for, for Jesus. Lord, we saw a lot of people that would exchange simple and petty things for your son and evil. God, help us to be much more like Simon or the thief that we would believe and trust in you with that whole and pure heart. God, bless these guys. Lord, may you give a special blessing to the mothers today. And Lord, if they don't have a son or one with them or living, just like you would for the fatherless or for the widow, Lord, may you be that person in their life today. May you honor them and love them. Lord, thank you for the gift of moms and, and thank you for the gift of your son in Jesus' name. Amen.